the year is 1996. And video games have come a long way in just a little over 10 years. From being a market once thought to be dead in the water after the video game crash of 1983, to being a lucrative business that spawned some of the most recognizable media characters in history, the growth has been substantial and the technology improved alongside it. From 8-bit to handheld systems to 16-bit, the games were looking better and better. There was just one thing holding the games back at the time, one major hurdle that was on the horizon, the Z-axis. Before this, games were 2D, you run left and right and you jump up and down, or you were playing top down. This was just how things were at the time. This old box couldn't do much better. But what if that all changed? What would a 3D game look like? What should a 3D game even be? These questions were all answered in 1996, with just a few simple words. It's me, Mario! Super Mario 64 was one of, if not the first 3D game ever made. Mario 64 was one of the first of its kind to give a polygonal world for you to explore and platform in, paving way for other games on the Nintendo 64 such as Banjo-Kazooie or Donkey Kong 64. It even helped set a precedent for games on competing platforms such as Crash and Spyro on the PlayStation and the major Sonic game on the Sega Saturn. It had set itself in place as one of the most important games in video game history, alongside the likes of its older brother, the original Super Mario Bros. However, it's been 28 years since the initial release of the game, and it's been re-released on the Wii, Wii U, Switch, and even got a remake on the DS. What made this game click back in the day, and does the game still bring that same level of greatness today as it did nearly 30 years ago? Let's look back at the game, and see if it does after all this time. When you boot up the game, you are presented with Mario's big head. You can play around with it, and it can result in some horrifying abominations. Loading up a file, you get a letter from Peach inviting Mario to the castle for... Cake. Mario jumps out of a pipe on his way to the castle, and it turns out the only way to enter the castle grounds is through the sewers. That seems a little impractical. Upon reaching the bridge, you get introduced to Lakitu, the cameraman for this game. This may seem odd, but remember, this is 1996. Back then, camera control was unheard of in a video game. People were so used to fixed cameras and platformers that Nintendo needed a way to introduce the concept of camera movement to the player. So they introduced a character that you could control to turn the camera. Upon entering the castle, you get told immediately to leave. It's here where you can enter levels and explore the worlds within by jumping into paintings. Peach is trapped somewhere in the walls, and the only way to rescue her is to collect power stars. Each level has six main power stars, a secret star for getting 100 coins, and there are a ton of power stars littered around the castle outside of the main levels. As you gain more stars, you can enter new levels and eventually the Bowser levels needed to progress. The first Bowser level needs 8 stars, which gives you a key to the basement. 30 stars unlocks Dire Dire Docks, which then unlocks the second Bowser level, and that unlocks a key to the upstairs, which unlocks more levels. 50 stars unlocks a door to the tippy top of the castle, with one final barrier, requiring 70 stars to make an infinite staircase, no longer infinite, and unlocking the final level, where beating Bowser one final time beats the game. Alright, simple plot. However, if you're playing Mario 64 for the plot, you're doing something wrong. What makes this game fun is the levels that you play in to collect stars. On the main floor, the first level you go to is bob -omb Battlefield, a literal fucking war zone. This is followed by Womp's Fortress, the military base for the Womp. I'm seeing a trend. Cool Cool Mountain, the icy mountain with penguins and a slide, Jolly Roger Bay, a water level with nightmares and a boat. These levels serve as great introductions to movement, precision, physics, and Jolly Roger Bay is a great introduction to sleep. A slow level with calming music? Oh boy, a perfect level to <sighs> The basement levels contain Big Boo's Haunt. Just a giant fucking house. Shifting Sandland, My Nightmares Incarnate, Lisa Lava Land, a bunch of random shapes on some spicy ground, Hazy Maze Cave, where the fuck am I going? And of course, Dire Dire. <laughs> me, me, me. Upstairs has Tall Tall Mountain, it's just another mountain level. Tiny Huge Island, a perfectly fine level until you have to deal with these little shits on tiny islands. And Snowman's Land, Snowman's Big Head? 
Yeah, sure, I'll have some of that. The Tippy only has two levels. TikTok Clock, a level where you can influence the speed of moving platforms, but doing anything but stationary is actively detrimental. And Rainbow Ride, a mess of random blocks in the sky. Seriously, an 8-year-old placing down random assets in a 3D Mario Maker would probably make this. These levels are open environments for you to explore and find stars, and for the most part, you can do them in any order you want. There are some stars restricted behind getting other stars, but that's only a few in the entire game. It's a ton of fun to run around and get the stars in whichever order you find them, rather than just being told, fuck you, you have to do this star and this star only. There's also a couple of bonus levels scattered around the castle, ranging from an aquarium, a slide you have to do twice, no indication that you have to do it fast enough the first time by the way, and my favorite, talking to Toad three times for three stars. The stars don't take that much time to collect either, you can get a ton in less than a minute with only a mild amount of skill, but the fast paced nature of the stars honestly makes them more fun for me. I just like making fast progress in games. The final type of levels are Bowser levels, which are completely different from the main levels. Instead of open areas filled with stars, they're linear platforming challenges where you move on a straight path up. There's only one star on each of these, a red coin star. These levels work great as tests of your platforming abilities, as the main levels don't really do that too much, at least to the same degree. In a lot of these levels, there are boss fights that get you stars. There's no more than one per level, and even then only some levels have them. bob -omb Battlefield has King bob -omb, a very simple boss as it is expected to be the first star you even get in the game. You just toss the guy around, nothing special. Womp's Fortress has King Womp, who is only significant because you can pound right through him. Big Boo's Haunt has three Big Boo fights, where you pound him. Tiny Huge Island has Wiggler, where you stomp a couple of times. They're all very basic. The fights aren't really that noteworthy or challenging. Each Bowser stage has a Bowser fight in which you grab him by the tail and toss him into a bomb, once on the first two fights and three times on the final fight. The timing for this is actually kind of precise and missing too many throws can leave you vulnerable to attacks. Though the thing is, the fights just aren't difficult, but they're still fun I guess. This game doesn't just contain Mario and his jumping abilities, as this game also has a couple of power-ups for you, being the wing, invisibility, and metal caps. The wing cap is unlocked by looking up at the sky, blinding Mario, and beating this red coin star that acts as a tutorial. The wing cap can be a bit finicky, however, and you can't really go up, only straight and down, which is a bit annoying. The invisibility cap is unlocked by clearing out the moat of all of its water and going to this hole where the water once was. The cap is kinda add to me. You can walk through a couple of walls, but only gets used in a few scenarios, and it feels more like an oh fuck I have to use this cap now, rather than being an actually exciting thing to use. I also find it funny how the level for it starts you off with the ability, but the only time you need it is right at the end, where you've definitely lost it by that point. Metal Cap is a funny one, and there are ways to 100% the game without it. It makes you invulnerable, and also sink in water. It's alright. The powers in this game just aren't that interesting at all. They are only used in a few parts, and it just makes it more annoying to have to go out of your way to get an ability to get some stars. Sometimes you're playing through a level, but then you have to stop partway to get a cap later in the game. Huh, you want to complete Jolly Roger Bane now? Well, too bad. Come back with a Mel Cap, sucker. They're also all temporary, so you can't do long flying sessions or anything. You have to keep getting more caps. At least the music is good when using them. Arguably, the most important part of a platformer is the movement. The movement can make or break an entire game. If you have terrible movement, the game will simply not be fun, no matter the level design. But tight movement with a good variety of options can make a game smooth, fun, and fast all at the same time. Luckily, Mario 64 has some incredible movement. Of course, you have the basic run and jump, but there's long jumps and dives to gain speed, wall jumps to scale walls, backflips to gain height, and triple jumps for even more height. You have so many options for movement and reaching platforms, no two people will get a star in the same way. The movement is also just really fast. There's a reason why Mario 64 is THE speedrunning game. The movement is incredibly fast and fun, and it's also very challenging to get good at. It makes an enjoyable experience for both runners and viewers, especially at a top level. The movement in this game is tight as well, you always have control of Mario and where he's going, which allows for such precise play. 
The one downside of the controls, however, is the camera. Now, this is one of, if not the first game with camera control, but the camera is a bit finicky to control. You don't move the camera fully, you only turn it in increments. The camera often can be in weird positions, and the increment system rather than full control makes it harder sometimes to get a camera angle you want. Oftentimes, you'd rather just leave the camera in its natural position and barely interfere with it. Overall though, the camera isn't a major problem, it's just a little annoying at times. This game has post-game content surprisingly, and man oh man is it interesting. Getting all 120 stars unlocks a cannon leading to the top of the castle. On top, you can find Yoshi who has a typo in his text box and thanks you for completing the game. He then gives you 100 lives, gives you a special triple jump, and then he fucking dies. The top of the castle has some really interesting sights, such as a pillar you can walk through, a ledge you can pull yourself up from and fucking die, and a wing cap you could use to reach the top pillar and fall through it and get stuck. Yeah, it's very clearly unfinished, and there's not much here in the first place. It's kind of funny though, just being able to so easily glitch the game, though frankly this game doesn't have the best collision anyway. It kind of sucks having a broken feature, but luckily it doesn't really matter at all, so who cares. It takes a lot for a game to leave a lasting legacy, and Mario 64 is one of the games that has managed to cement itself in gaming history, even being replayed constantly to this day 28 years after its initial release. With its tight movement, fun levels, and a nostalgia and speedrunning factor kicking around just as strongly as ever, this game has stood the test of time and will be played for generations to come. The game stands as an influential piece of media for game developers worldwide, introducing the world of 3D gaming and showing the potential it has as a way of designing games. It had a perfect impression on the gaming market and sprang the industry into a new era. While it is not a perfect game, camera controls are flawed and the powers aren't super interesting, it is undeniably one of the most important games of all time.